Hello, I'm Valerie Biden Owens, chair of the Biden Institute at the University of Delaware. Today, I have the privilege of introducing State Representative Malcolm Kenyatta. Malcolm has represented Pennsylvania's 181st House District since 2019. He is the first openly gay person of color and one of the youngest members elected to the Pennsylvania General Assembly. Thank you, Representative, for joining us today on this episode of All Politics is Personal, a program where we introduce the public to the person behind the politician. Anyone can research your policies and accomplishments, but that's not what we're about today. We're here to talk about you and what it was like growing up in Kenyatta. So for me, I talk about this all the time. You know, I grew up in a working poor family. My dad was a social worker and my mom was, for most of her career, she was a home health aide. She was trained as a CNA and did a couple of things, but really found her calling working with folks who had really significant physical and uh, mental challenges. You know, and I joke all the time and it's true every time I had the best parents in the world. They just didn't like each other that much. <laughs> did you have siblings? Yeah, I did. So, so they so they separated when I was pretty young. But my parents did um, adopt my my three siblings when I was probably, I guess, in kindergarten, preschool, kindergarten. Um, and so I have two sisters and a, and a and a brother. And when my parents split, my brother's much older. He was off to college, and then it was my mom and my my two sisters. And where are they now? So both of them still in Philadelphia, my sisters. My brother is in Florida now. How about school? Where did you, where did you go to school? So, you know, in part because we did move so much. All in North Philly, by the way, I should preface. My mom was like, we are staying in North Philly <laughs> no matter what. But because of that, I did bounce around to, to, to different schools. But I ended up graduating from Roxborough High School in, in Maniunk. What did you like about school? Or did you like school? I love school. Um, as you might imagine, I was involved in all the things and, you know, ran for student body president. I was prom prince. Did you win? Um, I did win. Good I for did you. win. Um, but I love school. It was an opportunity really for me as a, you know, kid who was not, was not out. I didn't come out probably until I was 16. Um, it was a real opportunity with so many things going on at, at home um, with the tenuousness that a lot of working poor families feel, right? You're always kind of figuring it out. And school was like that one constant, right? Where I had, in addition to the love and support of my mom, I had teachers who I'm always so lucky who really gave a damn about me and who took the extra time to refocus me, to make sure... I recognize the, the the power of my voice and the power of focusing in on something and sticking to it. And I think that that's something that certainly comes in handy yeah. <laughs> when you decide to run for office. You, uh, the youth today, Gen Zs, mm -hmm. talk about um, or feel mm -hmm. such um, so many challenges mm -hmm. that that. I remember as a child not feeling climate change, mm -hmm. gun violence. Uh, was there something uh, particular in your childhood that you felt um, anxious or most concerned about? You know, I grew up in the in the generation of 9-11. And so, you know, I'll never forget being in school. I think, you know, we were at lunch. I don't know why I had lunch so early in the day as kids, side note. But, <laughs> but in school and, uh, you know... All of us not knowing what was what was going on, you know, everybody calling their parents and in Philadelphia, at least, you know, feeling like, A, we're very close to New York, but B, obviously, we had the, the flight that came over Pennsylvania mm -hmm. and the incredibly brave folks who fought back on, on, on that flight. Um, so that was a that was a scary time. And, you know, we grew up in an, in an age where. You know, the, the fight against terrorism and the Iraq and Afghanistan wars um, were very much top of mind for us. And so I think for a lot of people, um, you know, who were my age, I know a number of folks, including my best friend, Lieutenant Colonel Tristan Monroe, um, enlisted in the, in, the, in the military to 
to, to go fight. And I think that that was very much front and center um, for, for, for our generation in terms of a big overarching um, issue. But unfortunately, some of the issues that you mentioned have been so persistent and so uh, all in, all encompassing, particularly in communities like mine, when you talk about issues of, of, of gun violence. It is difficult to grow up in a neighborhood like mine where the issues of poverty are rampant, where the quality education that every kid deserves is out of reach for too many young people, and where gun violence is you know, a constant challenge um, that that we really need to address. And it's been one of the reasons, frankly, you know, I, I ran for office yeah. and the issues we've been trying to fix. The social environment that you grew mm -hmm. up in, mm -hmm. that you have just spoken about, mm -hmm. do you think that, um, were you aware that you could get into politics and change or attempt to change some of those situations or was, was the were those situations of gun violence on the street were they just part of the environment or did they incite you in some way or motivate you in some way to move into politics you know it's so funny that you that you mentioned that so so for for me it's one conversation <laughs> with my mom that i think has driven not only my engagement into into politics but being civically engaged because i always try to tell folks there's a you know running for office right that's just one part uh, in voting, right? That's just one part of a healthy civic diet. It's not the only thing that you can do. So I'm 12 years old. I'm living on this block called Woodstock Street, which is used to be in my, in my district. It was just redistricted out, sadly. But I'm on this block. This is the second place we've lived since my parents have separated. And so we're moving around and I'm on this block and I'm just, I'm frustrated about everything, right? I'm a preteen. I'm pissed about what's happening with my parents. I'm pissed about having to move again. And I come home one day and I'm just like complaining about everything on the block. The blight, the trash, I don't want to be here. And I'll never forget my mom's in the kitchen. She's just lit a cigarette on the stove, okay? And she's smoking a cigarette and she's just staring at me as I'm like telling this, you know, just laying it all out. And she said, you know, if you care so much, why don't you go do something about it? And I was like, okay, I thought you can give me a hug, but like tough love, I'll take it. <laughs> and I ran for junior block captain. That was the first thing I ever did civically. Good. Did church play a big role in oh, your life? Oh my gosh, absolutely. You know, it's so funny. Well, you know, not aha funny, but you know, hearing folks really use my faith, which is so important to me, as a, as, a, as a sword instead of a shield, church was a place that, again, gave an opportunity for an awkward kid to feel loved, to feel at home, to stretch the, the, the leadership muscles and skill sets um, that I'm able to utilize now in my role. And it was a thing that was not, uh, it was not a choice. You went to, you went to church and we didn't just go on Sunday. Monday was prayer. Wednesday was Bible study. Friday was basically Sunday service, but on Friday. And on Fridays, and on Fridays, my pastor would have um, the young people come up onto the pulpit and we would do, he would still preach, but we would do all the other parts of the of the service. And so, you know, talk about a real opportunity that my that my bishop at the time, Bishop Rudolph Nash, um, that that he gave us this opportunity to really be leaders. Um, in the church. And then on Sunday, you had the early morning service, then you had the regular service. And then if he had to go to another church because he was a guest preacher or something, then you did that. And so people oh, talk about church. God, I know Catholic. church. Oh, all I have to do is mass. But uh, I heard, tell me, uh, were you a preacher, a, a pastor at age so at 12, 14, 14 or? Yeah, so at 14, I actually what got ordained. What the heck ordained. does that mean? So, so at 14, I got ordained in my in my church as a, as a minister. And so a part of what it meant was I went everywhere my pastor went. <laughs> and I would do all the different things that, 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 you, would, that you would do. Um, was that like your first job? 
Now, my first job was actually washing dishes, believe it or not. I washed dishes at this little vegan soul food restaurant, believe it or not, um, and was just so lucky because it gave me an opportunity to have just a little extra money. When, when did, wait a minute. When did you have time after all? <laughs> you're, you're a pastor and you're at all the church services. You're yeah. going to school. Yep. You're running for school yep. government in your class. Mm -hmm. when, did, when did you have time to work? You know, nothing has changed, right? Always have a thousand things. You got to do them all. And that's so valuable about working in, in food service. I ended up working in food service for, for many years after. You learn how to hustle. You learn how to just get it done, to have a thousand things that you need to accomplish. And you have to get them, you have to get them all done. But those things provided a real foundation for, frankly, being in politics, right? Where every single day, there are any number of things you have to do. You have to read legislation. You have to work with stakeholders to figure out bills that you want to work on. Is the language right? You're working with the lawyers. You're dealing with constituent services. You're worrying about the next campaign and raising money for that. And so I was really lucky because you don't recognize when you're going through something or you're getting that first job, the way that these skills are going to be cross applicable. You know, you're just doing the thing that you're doing at the time. But turns out, I think that these skills have served me really well in terms of the field that I decided to go into. How do you respond to the to the adage, uh, uh, the question, mm -hmm. how do you um, balance work and, uh, and play, how, uh, work and family? How do you balance it. I have an answer to that. You don't balance it, you juggle it. But do you, do you have a formula of balancing? You were just telling me of a, yeah. it sounds like it's not much of a balance in, in your life. I would say one word to that, poorly. <laughs> balance it poorly. It's, it, is, it is one of those things where I'm, I'm, I'm just so lucky um, that the man I fell in love with, uh, you know, at the very least, puts up with me. Um, but but more more than that, really is a is is, is a partner. Um, my husband, Dr. Matthew Kenyatta, is just the best of the best, and I'm, I'm I'm really lucky because I always say, and I and I mean this in the best way possible, but I think he would agree that you know he loves me. He doesn't love politics. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think he engages with you know the stuff that I do like enough to like know what's going on and and be involved and be helpful if he can be. But also, like, he doesn't care about my job. And I think that that's really helpful, right? When I come home, we're talking about the dishes and the, and the, and the dog and whatever, you know, new thing he wants to focus on in the house, whatever new home improvement project I'm being thrown into. Against my will, by the way. Against my <laughs> will. Um, yeah. And so that's been really helpful to have somebody who, in his work as an urban planner, is thinking about communities and how to build strong, you know, communities, but in a way that's a little bit separate, um, you know, from mine, you know, close enough, but separate enough that, that it's always, it's always something exciting going on, always something new going on, always something in our work that, that we get to discover. With, okay. So you've got this great guy. Mm -hmm. He's not interested in politics. No. Uh, when did you then decide, what was your spark that made you jump from your mom saying, do something about it, be in the community like mm -hmm. she was, to actually take a plunge and be run as mm -hmm. an openly gay person of color in Philadelphia? What, what so, was so the my click? Mom, my mom again, my mom... Um had a, a number of health issues and um, because of her, her diabetes, which like so many people, right, she would ration her insulin, wasn't always able to afford it. And, you know, that's not great for your, for your health. And she ended up having a stroke that she never recovered from and ultimately passed. Um, my dad passed um, from a brain aneurysm. He had epilepsy and had oh. a really bad seizure and um, ended up dying a couple of months after my mom, same thing, had a, had a stroke. And um, I always say I'm so happy that Matt got to meet her before before, before she passed. Um, but when she did pass, I had maybe like two weeks of bereavement leave like from my job. 
And then my boss was just like, you can stay a little longer. Like we get, this is a big deal for you. And so I went to visit him in California. He was still living there at the time. And I'm out there and I started hearing from people that uh, my predecessor, you know, might not run, that he was, you know, sick and was going back and forth about whether he wanted to run. And people were like, yeah, I know you're really sad, but a lot of people are going to run. So if you want to run, uh, you need to you need to start putting your campaign together. And I remember sitting with Matt at his uh, at his uh, he lived in this apartment building. And when I say pool, people think fancy. OK, but it's not fancy. OK, it's like crappy pool. But we're sitting out there and I'm just going through with him all the different reasons why I wouldn't be the right person. You know, we had only at that time elected one openly LGBTQ member of the General Assembly. And my colleague, you know, he represented the gayborhood, right? So there was like clearly a base of support. I was running in a, dis a district where I did not believe it was going to be well received that I was openly gay and, you know, and who I was and on and on. And as I'm sitting there just going through this whole litany of reasons why I would absolutely lose, this would be a waste of time. Matt said something that was so, I could just hear my mom again. He said, well, you're always like talking about this stuff. Why don't you just try it and do something about it? Why don't you just run? Just like ignore all that. You should just run. And that really like, it, it hit me like a lightning bolt hearing two different people. I'd never told him that story. Say basically the exact same thing. And that felt to me like, you know, fate in some way that, that my mom was yet again I'm sort of putting her thumb on the scale and pushing me to get out of my comfort zone and to do something about all the issues that I've been talking about. Because really deep poverty and all the things like gun violence that are a symptom of, in my view, this larger disease that we have people who are working. I think that's difficult for people to conceptualize. There's this idea that if you're below the poverty line, that you're just sitting on the couch waiting for a check, which is it cannot be further from the truth. People are working. My mom worked all the time and still was not able to make the numbers work. It's yeah. very expensive to be poor. And so I talked to local faith leaders and other elected officials. I would host events and bring people together for policy conversations. And so when I decided to run for office, I had people who thought I was running for re-election, which is like pretty good. <laughs> Were you scared? <laughs> Terrified. Terrified. I said, how the heck am I going to raise the money? I was running against, ended up running in a field of five or six people. Um, it was six people, including me, and then one person got knocked off the ballot. And two of the people had run before, and so we were running against people who, you know, were perennial candidates, but who also had gotten commitments of support from people in the community because they had run before. And so, you know, I had a number of conversations with people who ended up being important validators for me who had said, I don't know, Malcolm, because I'd promised this person, but you're really impressive too. And so I ended up getting a lot of that support, but it was very, it was very difficult. And toward the end of the campaign, um, we did, some of my opponents, in a Democratic primary, by the way, um, certainly ran with and ran very aggressive campaigns, uh, you know, against the fact that I was, that I was gay. Um, we put flyers all around the district telling, you know, people in North Philly don't vote for the for the gay guy, one of my opponent's brothers went around with, you know, put amplified sound on the top of his car, which is a very North Philly thing to do. But he went around all day and was saying, you know, North Philly, don't don't vote for the for the was gay it, guy. Was that the? Um, it, it goes exactly to what we're talking about that all politics is personal. Mm -hmm. uh, was that the hardest? What was the hardest thing? that you had to deal with? Was it that personal attack uh, or was it that people uh, uh, just weren't interested in, in voting or that you didn't have money? Mm. I mean, there's so many issues, so many elements in a campaign but mm. and so many you can kind of swat away, but some just really s stick. You know, words matter. Mm -hmm. My mom always said, you know, words are weapons. So be careful what you say because you can't take them back. Did besides your mom saying to you, um, 
you know, if you don't like it, do something about it. What, did she have any of those pearls of other pearls of wisdom that she told you that sustained you through this whole time? Because yeah. campaigns, at best, are hard. They are. I mean, you know, one of the things that she was, uh, you know, fond of saying is that you know nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. And I, I think for me, the biggest challenge was really believing in myself. You know, it's, it is easy to point to the words that are said externally about you that are, that are mean, that are harmful, that are wrong. But if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of times it's the inner voice that says the most cutting things. That little voice in your own head that's telling you you can't do it, um, you're not good enough, uh, you know, you should quit that voice is more pronounced and more powerful because that voice, you know, doesn't necessarily leave. That sticks with you. And so that, for, for me, that do something about it. That has driven me and sustained me in a way that no other piece of advice I've ever received has because it's a, re it's a reminder that there is nobody coming to save us, that the improbable nature of this this country when you think about it, everything about America is pretty improbable um, certainly my campaign was pretty improbable improbable things are done by people who are crazy enough to believe that they can do something about it crazy enough to believe and crazy like a fox okay to believe that if you actually step up and talk about what you believe is at stake you will find that there are a lot of other people who agree with you, who might not have been courageous enough to step up and step out in the way that you did. But what you will find is that courage is really contagious. And so when you do decide to step up, you find out that you're not standing alone. You're standing with a whole bunch of other people who were just waiting on you to say the thing that we were all thinking. My pastor would say, don't wait on your neighbor. Your neighbor might be waiting on you. And I think that that's true, that sometimes we're waiting on some external force or some external person, and the person who might change the entire game might be you all along. Well, Malcolm, you have wrapped up this session with uh, the profound words that all politics is personal. So I'm going to give you some rapid fire questions. Okay, here we go. All right. So as a Biden, I have to ask you, what's your favorite ice cream? Cookie dough. Cookie dough? Cookie dough. Well, I don't eat that. <laughs> you got to. I, like, I eat the real cookie dough. <laughs> <laughs> what profession, other than your own, would you like to attempt? If I was really brave, stand-up comedy. If I was really brave. What word, one word, would you use to describe yourself? Tenacious. Okay. Uh, what's your favorite TV show? Great British Bake Off. Best really? show on TV. Do you know how to bake? I So I'm a much better cooker than a baker, but the show has made me believe um, that, I, that I could do it. <laughs> uh, favorite music? I am incredibly eclectic in my, in my taste. If you had a hidden superpower, what would it be? Probably to fly. What's your favorite color? Purple. And like, I don't know who told you, but you have it on today. It was just intuition. <laughs> I just felt it. Uh, what's your birthday? I don't need to know the year. I just, what date are you? July 30th. Okay. That's everybody who can send you a card, you know, who's, who happens to see this. And if you had a theme song, or do you may, mm. perhaps you, you did in your campaign, did you have a song that you went on and off stage with, or do you have a a theme song about your life. Yeah. Um, on the campaign, it was um, Ain't No Mountain High Enough by Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell, which is the... I know that's that. That's the version you got to go with. Okay. There are other versions, but that's the appropriate version. Of okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I thank you for your rapid fire. And you know, just as, as an aside, if I could sing, I would be really good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to the Stavros Niarchos Foundation for their support. And remember, all politics is personal. <laughs>